Right now, our world needs good news. All around us, things are bleak. The world now faces the, the greatest disruption with the coronavirus since World War II. The coronavirus is affecting every part of life. Cities are in lockdown. Uh, the stock markets are in free fall. Hundreds of thousands are getting sick and even dying. And the hospital systems cannot cope. People are afraid. Now, panic buying is, is settling in as people strive for some sense of control, even if that means having a two-year supply of toilet paper or rice. Now, the coronavirus has exposed the idols of humanity, our idolatry of health, of, of money, of security, of power and control. All these idols have shown to be empty and worthless in the face of a deadly illness that has no respect for creed or race. Right now, our world needs good news. Our world needs hope. Our world needs salvation. And praise God that there is good news. The central message of the Bible is one of hope. It is one of salvation. It is one of good news. For the Bible is, is all about the gospel. The good news that God sent his son to save fallen humanity from sin and death. Uh, in this talk, we're going to get an overview of that great salvation plan in the Bible from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And we'll see in there our God's faithfulness and love. And we will find hope and encouragement in a world of fear and despair. Uh, it's Jesus himself that tells us that the Bible is all about him. Uh, the reason Jesus says to his disciples, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, verse 25 to 27. See, Jesus says that the Bible is all about him. Whether it's Noah in the ark, or, or Daniel in the lion's den, or Jonah and that big fish. Whether it's the Exodus, or the Passover lamb, or the building of the temple. Jesus says it's, it's all about him. It's all about who he is, and what he has done. See, if we were to summarize the whole of the Bible in one word... It would be Jesus. And if we were to use two words, it would be the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And Paul reminds us of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 to 5. He says, I delivered to you as a first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. See, Paul reminds us that the gospel is the central message of the Bible. It is the matter of first importance. And the gospel is the good news that Christ died as our Saviour and was raised as our King, uh, in fulfilment of the Old Testament scriptures. Uh, and in particular, the, the gospel is focused on the coming of the kingdom of God in the person of Jesus. In Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus proclaims the gospel of God and he says, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, the first thing a kingdom requires is, is of course, a king. And the second thing a kingdom needs is, is a people, subjects of the king. And the third thing a kingdom needs is a place where the king rules his people for their blessing. So as Graham Goldsworthy famously puts it, the gospel is all about the kingdom of God. It's about bringing God's people into God's place under God's blessing and rule. Well, let's see how this gospel of the kingdom unfolds throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we'll be using the headings of Vaughan Roberts' famous book, God's Big Picture. The stage one, the patterned kingdom. 
Uh, We begin with God's rule. The Bible starts with those famous words. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. See, God is the king of this world because he made it. You just imagine an an artist draws a a magnificent painting. Uh, And when they finish, they, they, they put their signature in the corner. They made it. And so it belongs to them. See, God is the creator of this world. It belongs to him. And so he is the king of this world. Secondly, we see God's people. Uh, God creates humanity in his image for relationship with him and one another. Genesis 1.26 Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens. Uh, Being in God's image means that we rule the world under his authority. Uh, And we do so in relationship with him and one another. Genesis 1.27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. See, we are made male and female in God's image. Now, and that's because we are made for relationship. We're made for relationship with God. We're made for relationship with one another. Uh, all this that social distancing at the moment, it reminds us that we're made for relationship. We are made in the image of the God who exists in eternity in perfect relationship. One God, three persons. Or thirdly, we see God's blessing in verse 28. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. And part of God's blessing is that we are to live and enjoy this wonderful world that God has made for us. See, that is the pattern of the kingdom. It's God's people, in God's place, under God's blessing and rule. And in Genesis 2, we see a prototype of that. God's people, Adam and Eve, are in God's place, the Garden of Eden. And they experience God's blessing. They have perfect relationship with with God, with one another, and with the world. They live in the paradise of Eden, with free access to the tree of life. But it's only as we we live under God's rule that we can enjoy this blessing. God commands Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree in the middle of the garden. They're not to grasp for God's place to decide good and evil from themselves. As long as they obey God's word and, and submit under his loving rule, they could enjoy the blessing of his presence forever. Of course, we know that is not what happens. Stage 2, the perished kingdom. Now, in Genesis 3, we see humanity rebel against God. That the serpent deceives the woman and the man and his wife break God's command. Genesis 3 verse 4, the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. See, sin is rebellion against God. Sin is when we say to God, I don't want you to be the king of my life. I want to live my life, my way, without you. I want to decide for myself what is good and evil, what will make me happy. This disease of sin infects everything we do. When when we lie, when we steal, when we're proud, we do what is best for me. Because we don't want God in charge. Now, of course, right now we are uh, experiencing this dreadful pandemic of COVID-19. But the Bible wants us to understand that the disease of sin is even more serious. It has a 100% fatality rate because God's punishment for sin is death. In Genesis 3, God comes in judgment against sinful humanity. God's blessing turns to curse. 
We see humanity's relationship with God is broken. They, they hide from God. And humanity's relationship with one another is broken. We, we blame, we hurt, we, we fight. And humanity's relationship with the world is broken as well. Our world is cursed. It is, is full of disease. It's full of disaster. It is a painful reminder every day that we have rejected our Creator. And of course, worst of all, God's people are cast out of God's place. They are, they're separated from the tree of life. Destined to die. And of course, the God of the Bible is not just uh, just. He is gracious as well. Now, the, the rest of the Bible story is, is God's, God's rescue plan. To, to save his people from death and, and bring them back to his place. To bring them under his blessing and rule. Now, even in the early chapters of Genesis, there, there are rays of hope. In Genesis 3.15, God promises a serpent crusher who will one day crush the Satan. And in the story of Noah and the ark, we, we have another picture of salvation. As, as God uses Noah to save his family from, from God's universal judgment through the ark. It's a picture of, of the salvation that, that Jesus would, would provide for all who, who trust in the ark of his cross. But soon the world is gathered again in arrogant rebellion. The sin problem remains. Stage three, the promised kingdom. Well, God's rescue plan continues with some great promises to Abraham in Genesis 12. The Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, we can remember these promises with the acronym FLOB, fame, land, offspring, and blessing. Fame, God promises a, a great name. Land, God promises the land of Canaan. Offspring, God promises to make him into a great nation. And blessing, God promises to bless him and all nations through him. <coughs> Do you notice how these promises are a, are a grand reversal of the fall? God chooses a, a new people. Who are going to live in a new place under his rule and God will bless the world once more. Well, these grand promises are, will direct the rest of the Bible story. <coughs> We're now at stage four, the partial kingdom. Well, as the Bible progresses, we, we see a partial fulfillment of the promises to Abraham in the history of Israel. Uh, in this partial fulfillment, God anticipates and, and foreshadows the ultimate fulfillment that will come in Jesus Christ. Now let me explain. Uh, before a uh, condominium is built, uh, the salespeople will, will often show you a, a little model of the condo. Uh, they'll show you, you know, where the gym is and where the pool is and, and where the car park is. You know, it, it's, a, it's a model pointing forward to the reality, the finished building. It's the same with a, with a shadow or, or, or with a signpost. They, they, they point away from themselves to a greater reality. And, and so with Israel's history, uh, it, it's a model, it's a, it's a shadow, it's a signpost pointing to a greater fulfillment in Jesus. Now the model is physical. We have a physical nation saved from a, a physical enemy heading to a physical land to receive physical blessings. But the reality, the destination, is spiritual. A, a spiritual enemy. A heavenly home. Spiritual blessings. Now, one of the most important lessons we learn from the model is that redemption is required for God's promises 
to be fulfilled. See, Israel becomes slaves in Egypt. Uh, unless they are set free from their, from their oppressors, they, they cannot live as, as God's people in God's place, under God's blessing and rule. Uh, and, and so God raises up Moses to, to rescue his people. He, he brings judgment on Egypt and leads Israel out. You might remember the, the plagues and the, and the final plague is the death of the firstborn son. Uh, in Exodus 12, Israel is told that they should take a lamb without blemish and kill it and paint the blood on the doorposts of the house. Now God is teaching that there is no salvation without sacrifice. And there is no salvation without substitution. If we want to be rescued, a price must be paid. Blood must be spilled. The blood of another. Now, the Passover as well is a picture of the redemption that Jesus would bring. Now, we are, we are slaves. We're not slaves of, of Pharaoh. We are slaves of the greater enemy of, of sin. And Jesus says in John 8, 34, Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now, like the Israelites, we can't save ourselves. We're slaves. We need to be rescued. And to be rescued, we need a sacrifice. And we need a substitute. We need a perfect lamb to die in our place. And that, of course, was was Jesus. John the Baptist proclaims, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John 1.29 See, there on the cross, Jesus dies as our substitute. He's, he's sacrificed to take that punishment that we deserve so that God's judgment could pass over us so that Satan could be defeated and we could be saved. Well, having saved Israel from Egypt, he brings them to Mount Sinai. He gives them the law to rule his people with his word. Uh, and they build the tabernacle. It's a symbol of God's presence with his people. And eventually, after 40 years in the wilderness, under Joshua, God brings them in to the promised land. And there we have it, God's people. In God's place, under God's blessing and rule. We have a partial fulfilment of God's promises. We read this in Joshua 21, verse 45. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. God was faithful. It ought to be the, the end of the Bible story. But it's not. Because sin is still not dealt with. Now, in the book of Judges, Israel sins again and again. And though God raises up judges to save his people, they, they are imperfect and their salvation is only temporary. It points to our need for, for a better Saviour who is, who is sinless. And eternal. And in the book of Samuel, God provides Israel with a king who will, who will rule and rescue his people. Uh, not, not Saul, he was the king they chose. He, he was strong and impressive on the outside, but disobedient inside. A disaster. No, God provided David, a king who trusted God and obeyed God from the heart. In the story of David and Goliath, it's a famous one, 1 Samuel 17. And there we see David, the shepherd king, saving his people, not with strength, but with humble trust in the Lord. See, King David foreshadows Jesus, who would save us at the cross. Now, indeed, God promises David that, that one of his sons 
will rule forever and be called the Son of God. 2 Samuel 7, one of the great passages of the Old Testament. God promises David, When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. They are great promises. And under Solomon, we once again have a partial fulfilment of them. For Solomon, of course, is David's son. And he does build the temple. And we also see under Solomon a, a, a fulfilment of the promises to Abraham. There's, there's fame as, as the nations hear of Solomon's wisdom and come. And land as, as God dwells among his people at the temple. And offspring, because God has, has multiplied Israel like the sand on the seashore. And, and blessing, Israel has riches and, and wisdom beyond measure. In all this, Solomon foreshadows the ultimate King Jesus, descended from David, the eternal Son of God, who rules God's kingdom forever and ever in glory and majesty. It ought to be the end of the story. But once again, sin is not yet dealt with. Stage five, the perished kingdom. Again, in one and two kings, we see a repeat of the fall. God's people sin. They, they, they commit idolatry again and again. They worship other gods. Now, it begins with Solomon, with his thousand wives and concubines, whose idolatry leads to the divided kingdom. But despite all the warnings of the prophets, the, the downward spiral continues in the kings that follow until the northern kingdom Israel is exiled to Assyria in 722 BC. And Judah, the southern kingdom, is exiled to Babylon in 587 BC. It's a repeat of the fall. Once again, God's people sin. And God, in his judgment, removes them from his presence. God's people no longer in his place. Once again under his curse. We're left to think, what of the promises of God? How will he reverse the curse of the fall and bring blessing to the nations? Now we're at stage six, the prophesied kingdom, prophesied kingdom. Well, even as the, the prophets prophesy God's judgment, they also look forward to the time when God's promised king, his Christ, would come and restore God's people. Now, there's many ways that the prophets look forward to Jesus, but let's just consider a few. Now, firstly, they promise a saviour who will rescue his people from their sins. <coughs> God speaks of this Saviour in Isaiah 49 and verse 6. It's too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. <coughs> God promises that, that his Christ will bring salvation to the world. And in Isaiah 53, we see how this Saviour would rescue his people. Although he was innocent, he would die in their place. He would take on himself their punishment and bring peace with God. Isaiah 53, verse 5 and 6. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
Well, not only do the promise, prophets promise a saviour, they also promise a king. A king from the line of David who will usher in God's kingdom. We read of it in Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. To, to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it and uphold it with justice and with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore. See, this Saviour King would bring about the fulfilment of, of all God's promises. He would bring a, a new exodus from sin and death. He would bring a, a new covenant for, with forgiveness of sins. He would bring salvation to all of the nations. Indeed, he would usher in a whole new creation where crying and sorrow and pain are no more. The prophesied kingdom. God's people, Israel and the nations. God's place, a new Jerusalem, a new creation. God's blessing, salvation, forgiveness. God's rule, his Christ, his eternal king. Well, of course, a remnant of God's people returned from exile. They, they rebuilt the temple. Now, that too foreshadows the gospel. There is sinners reconciled to God. But by the end of the Old Testament, the world still waits for God's saving King. They wait until Jesus. Stage seven, the present kingdom. With the coming of Jesus, all the promises of God are fulfilled. Do you remember them so far? God promised Adam and Eve a serpent crusher who would defeat Satan. And God promised Abraham fame, land, offspring, blessing for the world. God promised David a, a king who would, who would rule forever. God promised Isaiah a, a suffering saviour. And God promised in the prophets a new exodus, a new covenant, a new creation. But remember when Jesus was born, that promise fulfilled of a king. Luke chapter 1 verse 32. The angel says he will be great. He will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom. There will be no end. Jesus is that promised eternal king. And again, remember when Jesus was born, the words of the angel. The angel said to, to the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, Fear not, behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour who is Christ the Lord. Jesus is that, that promised suffering Saviour. And remember, thirdly, the gospel that Jesus preached. He, he said in Mark chapter 1 verse 15, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. See, Jesus is saying that he has come to usher in that, that long-awaited kingdom. So that God's people can be in God's place under God's blessing and rule once more. Jesus called on people to, to repent and believe, to, to, to follow him and enter his kingdom. And in his ministry, Jesus gave a glimpse of, of what that kingdom would be like. As he, as he healed the sick and as he, he drove out demons, as he calmed the storm and even raised the dead. See, Jesus came to bring a kingdom with no more sickness and no more sin and no more pain and no more death. 
And Jesus opened the way for us to enter that kingdom through his death on the cross. Remember there on the cross, Jesus' body was broken. Jesus' blood was shed. There on the cross, Jesus died as that, that perfect Passover lamb, sacrificed for our sin. He was forsaken, that we might be accepted. And he was punished, so that we might be forgiven. He was cursed, so that we might be blessed. He died, so that we might live. See, Jesus opened the way back to God, back into his presence. As he died, the, the curtain in the temple was, was torn in two from top to bottom. But Jesus did not stay dead. On the third day, he, he rose again, just as he had promised. It, it, it was the proof that he really was the Christ. He really was that, that, that promised king who would rule forever. Jesus brought the present kingdom, for Jesus was God's true people who never sinned. Jesus was God's place. He was God with us. Jesus was the source of God's blessing, forgiveness of sins. Jesus was God's promised ruler, the Christ. Before Jesus ascended, Jesus explained God's plan laid out in the Old Testament. It's there in Luke 24, verse 44. Listen to the words. Jesus said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. Jesus knew the Old Testament was all about him, who he is, what he's done. Our Saviour, our King. And the rest of God's plan is that Jesus' rule and rescue should be proclaimed to all the nations. Stage 8, the proclaimed kingdom. Well, in fulfilment of, of God's promise and plan, the risen Jesus sends out his disciples to make disciples of all the nations. In uh, Acts chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus says to the disciples, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so they did. Peter, Paul and the others. They, they took the gospel from Israel to the ends of the earth. And, and everywhere that gospel went, people turned to Jesus in, in, in repentance and faith. And they, and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. The proclaimed kingdom. God's people. All the nations. God's place. The church. God's blessing, the gift of the Holy Spirit. God's rule, a new covenant, the gospel. Well, we live in the time of the now, but not yet. God's kingdom has come. Right now, around the world, the nations turning to Jesus as their saviour and king. Right now they're receiving forgiveness and life. And yet we wait. The kingdom is not yet. Now our bodies still decay. 
And, and our world is still full of, of sickness and death. And our lives are still stained by sin. And we do not yet see God face to face. We wait for the day when Jesus returns. When God will set all things right. We wait with eager longing for the final fulfillment of all God's promises. That is stage nine, the perfected kingdom. See, when Jesus returns, our faith will be sight. We will see with our own eyes all of God's promises wonderfully fulfilled. Remember how the Bible ends, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. See, in that perfected kingdom, God's people will be a great multitude from every tribe and nation and language and people. And God's place will be that, that wonderful new heaven and new earth. And, and God's blessing will be no more tears, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. And God's rule, God himself will sit on the throne and rule us. And on that day, all God's promises will be fulfilled. God's people will be in God's place under God's blessing and rule forever and ever. See, friends, this is the good news that our world so desperately needs to hear. Our world is filled right now with so much fear of death. Our world is filled with so much pain and disappointment. Our world is filled with conflict and strife. And maybe our lives are just the same. Our world needs good news. Our world needs hope. Our world needs salvation. Our world needs Jesus. See, Jesus stands at the centre of all history. He is the reason we were created. And he is our only hope of joy and peace in eternity. And the circumstances of the present remind us of the futility of worshipping other gods, whether it's money, success, health, security, power, and control. They all disappoint us because they don't last. They, they never satisfy. They can never fill us with the meaning and the purpose and the joy we desire. And they certainly can't save us from death. Neither will the gods of any other religion. Our world needs Jesus. You need Jesus. And the gospel is the good news that Christ died as our Saviour and was raised as our King. And He offers us forgiveness. He offers us a fresh start. He offers us a place in a whole new creation. He offers us peace with God. Have you put your trust 
in Jesus as your Savior? Have you submitted your life to His rule? If you've not, will you trust Him today? Will you let Him be your King and your Savior? Well, if you have, Jesus ought to be the center of your life. See, all your goals and your desires and your dreams and your motivations, they ought to be aimed at glorifying Him. Not, not excelling in studies, not rising up the career ranks, but serving Him, glorifying Him. And Jesus has given us a mission. We are to proclaim the good news of Jesus to the ends of the earth, so that many more will come to Him and trust Him as their Saviour and King. Our world needs good news. They need the good news of Jesus. Will you preach Christ to this broken world? Let's pray. Our Father, we want to thank you that you are the faithful God who keeps all your promises. We want to thank you that in your love and grace, you sent Jesus to be our Saviour and King. We thank you that he died to take the punishment we deserve. And we thank you that even now he rules this world with absolute power and authority. Help us, Lord, to place Jesus at the centre of our life. Help us to speak the good news of Jesus to our world that so desperately needs to hear it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.